I want to continue. Uh, last week I talked a little bit about um, what our calling and, and what our duty is in the Lord as a church that we should be seeing ourselves more as a sending center rather than just a receiving center. Rather than just coming to get, we should be willing to go. This week I want to talk about role. In Luke chapter 10, I'm going to run through the entire chapter today. It's going to be brief. I think you're going to enjoy this. But it's one of those things that in Luke chapter 10, the Lord really lays out what our role or our responsibility in is outside of just the call and the duty. Now we're going to be taking a look at the, the depth of who we are as a Christian. And so from uh, Luke chapter 10, let me start with the word of prayer. We're going to start in verse 1 and kind of run through this. It breaks down effectively into three parts. We're going to start with the first part, dealing with ourselves as ambassadors. So let's start with the word of prayer. Father, I thank you so very much for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given to us to be, once again, to assemble as your family, to hear your word, to uh, uh, receive what the Spirit of God has uh, for us this week and to be able to work it out through our lives. Uh, again, Spirit of God, hiding behind the cross, only you have things of value this morning. I pray that you take it to our hearts. Help us to put it into practice. In Christ's name, amen. amen. So Luke chapter 10, verse uh, 1 uh, down through 3 Notice what uh, Scripture is saying here. It says, After these things the Lord appointed seventy others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest, into his harvest. Go your way, behold, I send you as lambs among wolves. Now, a couple of things I want to emphasize here. Notice in the very, very first verse, it says, And the Lord appointed. This means to equip in a specified way. Now, he's just not just talking specifically about the 70 disciples then. He's talking about how he equips disciples through the decades, through the centuries, through the millennia. That means that we are equipped in a specific way to be his ambassadors. Notice that it says that he equipped these 70 others and sent them out two by two, and again, notice the, the, the emphasis here, before his face into every city. The place where he himself was about to go. And so we have opportunity. This is what, if, if we can get this into our heart, we, if we understand that the Spirit of God uses us as, the, as God himself is working in other people's lives, that he prepares us in a specific way. He literally appoints us to something very wonderful here, and that is he joins us and enjoins us in his working relationship as he's dealing with uh, the salvation of the lost in the world. And then he says in verse 2 that the harvest is truly great. We're very aware of the verse that talks about the, the this verse that talks about the, the harvest is white, Okay, in other words, it's ready to be harvested, but the laborers are few. And here's the thing, as he prepares our hearts to go into the field, we also need to be praying that others would join us. In fact, as ambassadors, we need to be also helping to lead others and to train others and to empower others to do this very thing. Verses 4 down through 7, carry neither money bag, nor knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no other or no one on the road, but whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on it, and if not, it will return to you. And remain in that same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire, of his wages, excuse me. Do not go from house to house. Again, when, the, when you begin talking about this principle, what we're learning here is this principle of the person of peace. If you want to look at it this way, it's a simple thing to remember, pot. Okay, person of peace. So in our endeavor, as we want to share the gospel with other people, as God has sent us into this field that is ready to be harvested, we are to be understanding that we're appointed to such a work, number one, that he has specifically uh, uh, designed us for a particular task. And as we enter into this field, that we need to be praying that others would also enter into this field with us. And then we need to have full dependence upon him. When it talks about don't carry a money bag or a knapsack or sandals, it's talking about the complete dependence upon Jesus Christ. Now, in a later uh, action that Jesus sent other disciples out, he said, now, now it's time for you to take your money bag and your knapsack and your sword, he even said. 
And so what he was preparing these disciples to do was say, look, I need you to be completely 100% dependent upon me, not even shoes on your feet. But the principle applies to us as well. Even though we are capable at this point of taking those provisions with us, he says we need to be 100% dependent upon him. But, he says, whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And notice, and if a person of peace is there, notice the qualifier, if a person of peace is there. Now, back in my former and younger days when I was uh, taught that you need to just basically cram the gospel down everybody's throat, whether they want to hear it or not, we used to go door to door, knock, 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 hi, we're from a certain church, and hey, by the way, did you know that you're on your way to hell? That was pretty much our introduction oftentimes. And I thought, man, this is a terrible way to introduce anything. So I, I began modifying things as I went. But I also, you know, when I was corrected in that, and I was told, no, they need to hear the gospel. Whether they want to hear it or not, get them the gospel every time. And I'm telling you, that's wrong and it's unscriptural. What this is saying is that there's a qualifier. Before you begin presenting the gospel to anybody, notice to see whether or not they're a person of peace. What does that mean? It means if they will invite you into their house or into their life, in other words. If as you begin walking down that road with this person, you start to open up and uh, you do a little bit of probing every once in a while and just throw a, a little uh, a spiritual question out there like, can I pray for you? And if they say something like, yes, then you probably know fairly well that this is a person of peace, somebody that God's already preparing their heart to reach. So we need to be, as we're serving in this field, we need to be looking for these people of peace. And it says, your peace will rest on it. And if not, then it will return to you. What does that mean? Is that some kind of mystical thing where, where this aura of, of a Christian kind of descends upon somebody else and there's this nice, you know, peaceful thing? No, it's none of that at all. It's really simple. The fact is that as we enter into a relationship, your peacefulness will be able to invade, if you will, their life. They will start looking at you and saying, wow, there's something about you that's different, and I'd like to know what that is. We don't have to force the issue. We don't have to cram anything down their throats. It's a simple lifestyle. I, I believe in lifestyle evangelism, but not that alone. I think you have to talk about it too. But that lifestyle really is, that peace really does pervade into other people's lives. And then it says it'll, it'll remain in the same, then remain in the safe, same house, eating and drinking such things as, as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. And this is an emphasis that helps us to understand that we don't need to be just shooting all over the place trying to you know, get the gospel here and then get the gospel here and then get the gospel here and just do a little bit here and there. That we need to be building bridges, a relationship. The depth of that relationship is what helps them to see that the goodness of the Lord leads them to repentance. And so in our lifestyles, we want to be building these kinds of relationships. Does that mean we have to be best buddies with everybody? Absolutely not. I don't think you'll ever have the depth of the best buddy thing with everybody. But what that does mean is this, and I've been trying to practice this more and more. When I go into some place like Starbucks and have a cup of coffee, I try to learn the barista behind the counter. If I go there frequently, I try to learn their names. I try to ask them, you know, how's it going today? What's, what's going on in your life? Well, man, I'm having a tough day. Hey, things will get better. Don't worry about it. Let me, let me pray for you, okay? I try to start responding in those ways. And I'll tell you what, it, it works. Because these people are now saying, oh, hey, I know you. Uh, you want your regular today, right? And I say, yeah, that'd be really great. So now we've got this relationship going. I happened to see one of the baristas actually at a different place. And I remember her name. Her name was Carla. And I said, hey, Carla, how's it going? And so she remembered me, and it turned out that she was also a Christian, so we had a time of fellowship. It was really some cool stuff. So as you're going here, as we're in, entering into this work field, we want to be building those relationships. Verse 8, whatever city you enter, and they receive you. Notice again the qualifier, and they receive you. You're constantly looking for the people of peace. Eat such things that are set before you. Heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, how in the world does this apply to us in America? I think it's pretty simple. It's the same principle that was in ancient times valid. It's also, uh, it's also valid in today's days that we are to not only build this relationship, but as people start to bear their souls to us, as we begin to see the needs in their life, that we are to approach those needs, that we're to engage those needs. 
Now, it could literally be praying for and healing the sick. It could literally be that. Given the opportunity, if you have chance to go on a foreign mission field, you will see things there that we don't often see here, simply because we failed to practice it here. When I was in Nepal the last time, I had a conference in, in Nepal Gunge, and given that opportunity there, after a couple of days, the conference was finished, and I just finished a, a discussion, a, a, t a training on, on healing. And I'll tell you what, I am not one of those guys that I think the, some of these people on television and the guys that sell the, the healing scarves and all the stuff that they, you know, they put a blessing on it and then they sell it to people. I think it's all charlatan stuff. And it's given healings a bad reputation. But God's in the healing business. He will perform miracles even here in the United States if we're willing to step out of our comfort zone. And in that little, after that little conference in Nepal Gunge, one of the ladies came forward after everything was over and she, she couldn't speak English and I didn't understand what was going on. So I asked one of the interpreters to come and to talk with me with her. And she says, I've been having this, this uh, terrible pain. It's been with me for a long time, many years. And I've been to doctors and, I, and I'm just asking for healing. Would you pray for me? So I gathered the leaders around and I said, we need to pray for healing for this woman. And we put our hands on her and we prayed for healing. Now she got up and nothing happened. And as we walked out 30 or 40 minutes later, as I was ready to finally leave that place once and for all, over in the corner, she started kind of going like this, trying to get my attention. I said, what's going on? And she goes like this. And I said, what's, what's happening? Somebody tell me, I elbow my interpreter, what's going on over there? And he says, she wants you to know that she's healed. That pain is gone. That Jesus did, and Jesus will do the healings. And we can't be afraid of that. I think I've told you the story before, but a more domestic resp uh, response to that is I had a friend whose uh, wife was in an auto accident, had a terrible brain injury. I knew the, the surgeon, the brain surgeon, and he was a Christian man, and I asked him specifically as we went there in, in the hospital, we were praying through the night, and I asked him specifically, what's the prognosis here? He says, it's one of the worst brain injuries I've ever seen. If she survives, she will have a life as a vegetable. I don't think she'll ever walk again. She may never talk again. And so we prayed. We held hands around that bed with the doctor there. And we prayed earnestly for the healing. A week later, that woman walked out of the hospital. She is now as normal and healthy as anybody else. Amen. God works miracles. And we can't be afraid of that. But that isn't what the point is either. The point of our Christianity is not to see mystical, miraculous things all the time. It's just part of what we do. It's part of what God does through us. And so he says here, eat such things as they set before you, which by the way, if you're going on a mission, <laughs> if you're going on a mission uh, a trip at all, you don't know what gets set before you sometimes. It may not have the same level of uh, saran wrap clean, uh, uh, cleanliness that we have here. And I'll tell you what, there's not one thing that has ever been set before me that I rejected. I simply, <laughs> I simply say, Lord down the hatch, please bless it. Diarrhea for Jesus, man. <laughs> but honestly, he's always, he's always taking care of me. Always taking care of me. Always. And even though I did have some upset stomach at one point in time, it passed quickly. So it's one of those things that you can rely on the Lord. And when he sends you, he'll take care of you. So eat such things that are set before you. Heal the sick. And then say to them that the kingdom of God has come near to you. You see, you can't leave the gospel out of it either. I don't think a lifestyle evangelism is meant to be alone it's meant to be a segue a, a bridge that we can have then to be able to get into people's lives that we can then present the gospel to them verse uh, uh, 10 down through 11 then but whatever city you enter into they do not receive you again here's the qualifier now from the opposite direction go out into the streets and say the very dust of the city which clings to us we wipe off against you nevertheless know this that the kingdom of God has come near to you now the Bible talks about don't cast your pearls before swine. I never really understood that verse until I began to understand that God is selective as to who the gospel gets presented to. That he has given us a clarity in Luke 10 about how we're to seek this person of peace. That God has prepared their heart to receive the messenger. And ultimately, Lord willing, to receive the message. And those who reject it you know, God, uh, the Bible goes on to say from, from this point, 
Jesus goes into a little bit of detail after this, and I'm not going to read that section. You can read it on your own. But he goes into a little bit of detail. He says, Woe to you, those who reject the messenger and the message, because it'll be worse for you than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. If you can imagine that, take your responsibility seriously about presenting the gospel so that when we have that opportunity, that people know that the kingdom of God has come near to them. And notice what it says then in verse 16. After warning these disciples and saying, you know, you can knock the dust off your feet and it'll be worse in the day for that particular area, that village or whatever it is that it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. He gives them that warning. Then he says this, because he wants his disciples to understand it's not about you. It's not, it's not personal. Verse 16, he who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you rejects me, and he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. This is, you know, when, when you're an ambassador, do you understand the term that an ambassador is? You're a representative of a government. You are, you are entrusted. In fact, you are the representative of the government to that area. And so what government are we representing here? It's the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God. We are His representatives. We have all authority given to us that we can actually see these miraculous things take place. We are His eyes. We are His ears. We are His hands and His feet. And we are His ambassadors in this world. And so we don't have to take it personally. If somebody rejects us, oh, you're one of them. I've heard that I don't know how many times. Oh, you're one of them. I always ask them, one of them what? What, I got three eyes? One of them what? Now you're one of those Christians. Yeah, do you understand what that means? Dude, I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. All my sins have been forgiven. I've been made a child of God. That God has accepted me, adopted me. I am a, not only going to receive an inheritance, but I'm going to be a co-inheritor with Jesus Christ. And dude, I want to share that with you so that you can have the same. Do you know what it means to be a Christian? Because most people don't. They just know the negatives of what they've heard or experienced. But Jesus says not to take it personally. Verse 17 down through 20. This is so cool. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, notice what they said. I mean, here, they did what God wanted them to do. They went out two by two. They presented the gospel. They did exactly what Jesus just lined them out to do. They come back now, and the Lord, even the demons are subject to, to us in your name. They thought, man, this is so cool. We saw all these miracles taking place. And even the demons, we were able to exercise people and, and get those demons out of their life. That was so cool to see. And notice what Jesus says. He responds to them. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, Catch this difference. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. You see, it isn't about the miraculous. This is where I think so many modern day Christians get off track. They think that if somehow or another they come to Lord, know the Lord Jesus Christ and they're, they're walking, they're going to start doing miracles and they're going to start seeing these miraculous things take place. And it's all about the mysticism of the spirituality. Why do you think people are, are, are in Wicca? White witches. Why do you think? See, they think that by being a, a white witch, they're doing good things because they're, 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 they're harnessing the power of of the natural and the supernatural for the good of mankind. It's because in us as human beings, we want to see the miraculous. We want to think of something that's supernatural beyond us. Why is there so much emphasis in Hollywood with these extraterrestrial beings? Why is there so much interest in that? Because there's all of this idea that somewhere there's, there's something miraculous out there. There's something beyond us, something supernatural. Why all the superhero movies and everything nowadays? Why such a resurgence in that? It's because we want to, as a, as a culture, we want to embrace the supernatural, those things which are beyond us. But Jesus is saying that's not what Christianity is about. That's not what the walk is about. He says, yeah, I've given you all that power, but that's not what it's about. It's not about you. It's about the fact that you have 
your name written in heaven, that you are a child of God, and you're simply doing what God has asked you to do as an ambassador. He goes on to say, in verse 21 and 22, in that hour Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. I want to stop there. I want you to soak that in for a second. That is so cool. Because when you do what God wants you to do, Jesus re rejoices in that. When you just simply do what you've been designed to do, and it comes naturally to you now, and you're just walking out there, and you're, and you're seeing people, you're focused on the people of peace, you're entering into relationships, you're sharing the gospel with them, they come to know the Lord as a result of that, you're discipling them, you see them baptized, you see them trained up, and they start reproducing. Jesus is rejoicing in that. And then he goes on to in this prayer. He says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and revealed them to babes. I want you to soak that in for a second. Do you realize how privileged you are to understand these mysteries of God? That you are set apart. That not everybody in this world understands these things as you do. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And who the Father is except the Son, and catch this phrase, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. That's powerful. If you're sitting in these seats today, and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus willed it that you personally should have a relationship with him that you personally should know the mysteries of God that you personally should be an heir to all things of eternity he willed it and then he said now I need you to do something for me go that I might have more children I have prepared people of peace go and seek them out find them Everybody has a sphere of influence. You have friends, you have family, you have co-workers, you have schoolmates. You've got somebody in your life that you can then present this gospel to. That you can let your light shine into their life. And it should be a natural outflowing. It shouldn't be some coerced or rehearsed situation. But the sun is working through you. And he has prepared these people of peace. And if we seek them out then God wills that they, would be, uh, that they would have the Father revealed to them. Verse 23 and 24. And he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things which you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you have heard and have not heard it. You see, there are Old Testament prophets and kings who desired to see the day of the Messiah to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to see the movement of the Spirit of God in the salvation of not only the Jews, but also of the Gentiles. They desired to see those days. And yet those disciples back in that first century was the start of that work. And Jesus is reminding them and letting them know, look at the blessing that you're receiving, that you're seeing these things. Now I want to throw this out to you. I believe with all of my heart that we're in the last days. And that right now there's a pouring out of the Holy Spirit on this planet. We see it in Nepal. We see it in India. And what's cool about it is we're seeing it here. That, that outpouring of the Spirit of God, just like the second after, uh, chapter of Acts. If you really want to see a miracle, then get involved with the work where Jesus is working right now. And you will begin to see these things taking place in your life. And you'll get caught up in this whole wonderful wave of evangelism that's taking place. We are seeing a modern day outpouring of the Spirit of God in this country and in, uh, across the world. And he said to these disciples, cherish that. Cherish that. So here's the principles that we learned from the first 24 verses. It's called the person of peace principle, the pop. So seek the person of peace when you have found them, build that relationship. Eat, heal, and say that the kingdom of heaven has come near to you. And then remain there. Remain with that person to build up that relationship. Don't just go hopscotching all over the place. It isn't about numbers. It's about quality. 
and the depth of that quality. God is in charge of the reaping and the fruit, not us. Then he goes on to say this. He starts talking to the disciples. Now remember, he sent 70 out. 70 came back. They rejoiced. He told them what they ought to be rejoicing in, that it's not about the miraculous stuff, but it's about the fact that they already have their names written in heaven. He just let them know it's not about how much you do, but the quality of the work that you're doing, that you're pouring yourself into these other disciples, these people of peace that you're actively seeking. He's letting all, all these people know that. And then within this group, around this group that were not of the 70 disciples, there's this lawyer there, this Jewish lawyer. And, he's, and it says in verse 25, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, he's testing Jesus, trying to catch his words. And he said to him, What's written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so the lawyer said this, and he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly, do this, and you will live. That's an interesting statement. He said that if you do this, you will live. The question was, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He didn't say, profess Jesus Christ, repent, and turn by faith, did he? Although that is, I mean, you learn from Scripture, that is what you have to do. But what did he say? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and you're well on that road. But notice what happened in verse 29. He, trying to justify himself, now the lawyer's trying to justify himself and said, yeah, but who is my neighbor? And isn't that the justification that we all try to make? Well, come on, God. I mean, I'm not a preacher, so I can't preach. I'm not a Bible teacher, so I can't do that. So what am I really supposed to do? Who is my neighbor? That's really what he's trying to get across. And Jesus answered with this parable. He said, A certain man went down to Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. Notice what it says. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. I'm going to stop here for a second. We all know the story fairly well. There was a, a study done at a uh, seminary with master level seminary students. They were told that if they, uh, that they had this uh, presentation to do and they had a very short time to prepare it and they would get all of the briefing, but they had to go all the way across campus to get the briefing. And on their way, the team had planted a person laying on the sidewalk that had a need. And out of all of the students that did that, and I think there was, forgive me if I don't have the correct number here, I think there was about 30 students that participated in this. Of all of those people who participated, is only two stopped to help. Now, Jesus asked the question, or was asked the question, how do I inherit eternal life? And he answered and said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Now he's talking about neighbors. How do you be a good neighbor? Then he's using this example, and he says, now this religious guy, this priest, he came by, and he saw what happened, and he walked around him. The Levite did the same thing. He saw what was happening. He walked around him too. Now a Samaritan, a half-breed, somebody that the Jews despised, somebody who didn't believe that they had the same level of, of religious favor with God that the Jews had. Then a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And I believe that this is the earmark of faith. That we don't just walk through this world as religious people passing by those in need, but we have compassion. So he went to him and he bandaged his wounds and he poured oil and wine and he set him on his own animal and he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. 
On the next day he departed, he took two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, whatever you, uh, more that you spend, I, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him that fell among the thieves? And the lawyer gave a good answer and he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Do you see the prerequisites for eternal life? You can't know the Father unless the Son introduces you. You can't be introduced to the Son unless there is one who is filled with the Holy Spirit leads you to the Son. Do you see your responsibility? And more than that, you can't have eternal life if you're just religious. You see, the priest and the Levite, they knew the law. They knew every command. Even this attorney, this lawyer that Jesus was talking to had the right answer. What was the condition? What was the problem? No compassion. No true, honest-to-goodness action. Our churches are filled with pew-sitters. Our churches are filled with people who know the Bible better than two-thirds of this world understands the Bible, and yet they don't have enough compassion to meet the needs that are around them. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Be like the Samaritan. Be the one that nobody else likes, but be the one that has compassion. So in order for us to be ambassadors, we also have to be neighbors. And if we're going to be neighbors, we need to learn how to love our neighbors properly, which is to love God first and supremely, to love yourself properly according to that love, and then to love others by being a good Samaritan, to get involved in people's lives. That's what he means. Be a good neighbor. And the very last part of this Luke chapter 10, verses 38 down through 42, I'm going to deal with the first... Uh, down through 41 first, is this comparison now that Jesus makes between Mary and Martha. Now, you know what's intriguing to me is all of this, of course, it's the English Bible that introduced all the chapter breaks and all that kind of stuff, right? So really, when this was all written, it was all written in continuity. And when we begin to understand that, that continuity, when you go back to the beginning of chapter 10, at the end of chapter 9, Jesus is dealing with the in recruitment of disciples. And he has one person that comes to him and he says, hey, I would follow you anywhere. And he says, look, I don't have any place to even lay my head. Why would he respond to him that way? It's because Jesus is saying there's a cost to discipleship. There's a sacrifice that has to be made. And then he's told one, come and follow me. And he says, yeah, well, just wait a minute. I have to go bury my dad first. Commentators believe that his dad wasn't even near death. In other words, he had to be a good son, stay faithful to his family. And then when his dad died and was buried, then he'll come and follow him. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. Sounds like a harsh response, don't you think? But he says, My, the cost of discipleship means immediate obedience, not delayed obedience. Because delayed obedience is disobedience. And then comes chapter 10. And then comes the 70. And then comes the whole story about being a good neighbor and what it really means that if you want eternal life that you can't just sit in a pew and be religious but you have to be a good Samaritan get involved in people's lives connect with those people meet those needs have compassion spread the gospel through a lifestyle evangelism as well as telling them that the kingdom of heaven is near and finally he gets to this place where he's talking about these two ladies Mary and Martha now it happened that uh, verse 38 says, And now it happened that as they went, they entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed her, her, him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But, notice the distinction, there's the clarifier, but Martha was distracted by much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Do you realize how arrogant of a statement that is? She, thinking she's right by serving, is telling 
the Lord of Lords and King of Kings to do his job right. That if you just realize how much work I'm putting into this, Jesus, that you would just get somebody out there to help me. Come on, I'm doing the best I know how. But notice what he says. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. Now I love the statement, but one thing is needed. Verse 42. And Mary has chosen that good part and it will not be taken away from her. Now what was that good thing? If you go back to the previous verses, it says that Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and heard his words. The principle and the takeaway that we have with this is that we need to be in Jesus. We need to be a Christian. And it's not just about the doing. Doing comes with it. We have to have compassion, but it's a result of being. We get that backwards, don't we? We end up wanting to do, 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 do this performance-based religious stuff. And the next thing we know, Jesus says, I don't even know who you are. But Lord, Lord, I, I did all these things in your name. I don't even know who you are. And the same thing is happening here. He's saying, Martha, you don't get it. It's not about the serving. It's about being with me. And he says this one thing that Mary has chosen will not be taken away from her. So the principle that we need to understand is as worshipers, there's three aspects that we learn from this passage of Scripture that are all formed together. That we are ambassadors, that we are good neighbors, and that we are worshipers. So don't get distracted with the serving. Sit at Jesus' feet, be, and not just do. So if we put all of this together, what's Jesus teaching us from Luke chapter 10? That we are to be about the Father's business. There's no doubt that we need to be out there serving. But it's not about chalking all these things up. It's about sitting at his feet and joining him where he's already at work. Leave the production, leave the fruit to him. And don't worry about it. We're to seek that person of peace. We're to eat and to heal and to say that the kingdom of God is near you. We're to seek that relationship, in other words. And we're to remain there with that one individual or that one house and not spread ourselves too thin, but to remain there and put the quality that's in. Then we're to be a good neighbor. We're to love God first and supremely, to love ourselves uh, appropriately with respect to that relationship with God, and then to love others and to be that good Samaritan. And then we're also to also, uh, also be worshipers through this. And we need that one thing that's in our life. We're not to get distracted with the serving. We're not to get distracted with the miraculous. We're to stay focused on what Jesus is doing by sitting at his feet, hearing him command us to come and to work. And we're to be and not just do. And so what Luke chapter 10 teaches us is our role as ambassadors, as neighbors, and as worshipers. And so connect that with our calling and our duty. And what does that give us? It gives us our responsibility before the Lord as disciples. We need to count that cost, recognize that it's important to be serving him, but not that the serving is the end in itself. Not that the miraculous is the end in itself but that we are to be worshipers first and foremost. And all of these other things spring out of that. We have the opportunity in this church. In fact, we were all back there praying about it earlier. We have this opportunity to go to Nepal and to India and to South Africa. And we've been called to this community. And we'll be strategizing here very soon about what we can do to re-reach this community for Jesus Christ. But it means these things that we need to be ambassadors, good neighbors, and worshipers authentic in our walk with Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we just thank you so very much for what you're teaching us through Luke chapter 10 and also how we're to not only be those ambassadors, but we're also to be a good neighbor. We're to be worshipers. We're to have, let everything kind of spring from that relationship with you. That it isn't all about the doing. It's not all about the miraculous. But Father, you've taught us today that we are to be always about your, uh, your business, that we are to be centered and seated at your feet. And then when you say it's time to work, we're to roll up our sleeves and get the job done. Father God, bless us on the mission field this, this year. Bless us as we go from this building to recognize we're walking into the mission field from here. And Lord God, encourage and bless us in our, in our lives that when we stand before you, just as your word says, that you will rejoice. 
that you will be so glad that you're able to bestow upon us those things which are ours by right of inheritance through Jesus Christ, not of our own works, not of things that we've conjured, but, Father, truly following you. Help us to always do that through the Spirit of God. Bless those words. Let it sink deep into our hearts and work out in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.